What's up? It's Friday and it's a continuation of Journal Week. Sort of. Mmm, blog smoothie. Mm. First of all, some exciting news to share with you. I got Hank's new CD in the mail today. Yay! So excited and it's Wednesday, not Friday because I got this today. And I bet most of you that ordered them got them on Wednesday and you're watching this video on Friday. Uh, I'm just going to go on to the next topic because this is pointless. At least this week I have a legitimate reason for taping on Wednesday because on Friday I'm going to be at Bear Lake and on Thursday I'm going to my cousin's wedding. So I don't have any other time to tape and I pretty much waited until the last possible minute that I could on Wednesday. So huzzah. I said it was a continuation of Journal Week, sort of. The reason being that I'm not exactly reading a journal entry. I'm reading stuff, though, that is embarrassing and that was written in the past. So I think that that kind of is the same thing. This is actually a paper that I started writing for my English class when I was in high school. I'm about 16 at this time. I didn't turn it in, luckily. I'm about to read this to you. I'm going to put on my reading glasses, by which I definitely do not mean glasses that are actually fake that I just wear because they make me look cool, and by cool I mean nerdy, uh, but in the coolest way possible. Be quiet, family. Can you hear my dog barking? My brother talking and singing? I can. <coughs> An untitled piece of work by Kira, last name censored, of second hour honors English, composed October 1st, 2003. She was home alone, sitting on one of the scarlet colored recliners in the library, the one with the blood stain that reflected memories past. There was but one person who knew exactly what had caused that relic of blood that blended so calmly into the coloring of the rest of the chair, and he was thousands of miles away on a yacht, preparing to brutally annihilate his next victim. She didn't know how the stain had come to be. In fact, she didn't even know it was there. She had, after all, only lived in this mansion for a month or two. It was one of those moments where you're sitting in a room, and you know that you're utterly and completely alone, but sense that it is otherwise. As she read her book next to the warm, cozy fire, she got that exact feeling and sat up suddenly. She searched the area around her chair, and then the entire library, and then expanded to a search of the whole mansion. She checked every corridor, every hall, and every single one of the 43 rooms. There are 43 rooms. Who knows why I picked 43? Like, really? I don't know. She found nothing, but the feeling continued to linger. She shook it off, telling herself she was being stupid. You see, she had spent the past little while listening to the people of this small village, telling her tales about people who had been killed in murder mansion and still haunt whomever is living there. Just before she moved into murder mansion, the house had been damp, derelict, and disinclined to oblige prospective buyers. She had actually inherited the mansion from her great uncle Algie, who had died seven months prior to our story. She was not superstitious and didn't believe in ghosts, but who could blame her? She was completely alone except for her golden retriever, Thorpe. She decided with all of her sense that she'd gained at college that no one was in the house with her, especially since Thorpe was relaxing on the living room rug. If anyone was in the house, he would be barking like mad and tracking them down. As she woke up a few mornings later, Thorpe brought her the morning paper. As she pulled the rubber band off the rolled up newspaper, the Morning Star, she threw a quick glance at the front page headline. Serial killer escapes again! 